Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the TD Show. Uh, tonight's guest uh, probably needs very little introduction, uh, but I'll give it anyway. Uh, tonight's guest is Tim Just. Uh, welcome, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? Great, thank you. Uh, Tim, for those who don't know you, um, you are a national tournament director. I'm sure you've been one of those for a little while. Um, FIDE National Arbiter. Uh, also a member uh, of the Rules Committee and TDCC, and I believe a former chair for quite some time of the TDCC. Right. And most importantly, I think uh, for everybody uh, who's tuning in tonight, you've been the editor of the 5th, 6th, and 7th, which is the current edition of the US Chess Official Rules of Chess. That's been quite a task uh, <laughs> and quite enjoyable. I've, uh, it's almost like being a in the zone when you're yeah. working on that thing you just that's all you focus on nothing else all right i i know i treasure my uh signed sixth edition uh of the of the rule book that you gave me but uh, i i need to get you to sign my online version of the seventh edition i guess <laughs> uh, someone actually sent me a link on how to do that yeah and i thought no nah, that's a step too far right all right, so um, for anyone who uh, I didn't see um, tonight's topic, um, basically we're not going to discuss uh, one specific rule like we have done the, the past couple of weeks. Uh, Tim is going to give some generic uh, TD tips. Uh, I've called it Tim Just's Top 10 TD Tips uh, for purposes of uh, titling the show for something. So um, Tim, why don't we uh, get into it? And uh, I see we've got some... Some people watching the show here and ready to uh, ask questions. Brian Yang, I see, and uh, Enrique Huerta, uh, both national tournament directors. Um, so hopefully uh, we can keep them on their toes and they can learn something too. So let's get over to um, your first tip, Tim. Yeah, uh, a lot of these tips, by the way, come from the workshops I've done over the years. And they're just general ideas for the everyday TV. We're not looking to give you tips to become the greatest super Swiss star on the face of the earth running tournaments. And the first tip is post it and announce it. Uh, the most obvious thing is if you're going to do something that's a little different than the rule book, you ought to post it and announce it. You want everybody to know what you think they should be doing at that tournament. Like you might say as a, a TD or an organizer, analog clocks can be used in preference to digital clocks. I wouldn't suggest doing that, but if that's what you want to do, you ought to let the people at your tournament know that. The other things that I've always found interesting over the years is you, putting up signs about all kinds of information that people like, uh, like the special tournament rules we just mentioned. Uh, you get asked, what, the, what are the time controls? Well, you should have a sign up and you just point at it. People can read that. Round time, you point at it. People can read it. Price fund, well, point at it, people can read it. It's pretty simple. Bathrooms is kind of a fun one. Uh, the, Todd Berry, who I used to work with, would always have a sign up and, and he'd number these various things that you see listed here. And one of them was bathrooms. And someone would say bathrooms, they go, look at number three. And it would say something like, go down a hall to the left, and it's the first door on your right. <laughs> and people want to know where they can get food and beverages. That'd be real nice to let them know that. Yep. Um, what, uh, so, so funny, I think, um, so I was, think I was talking to you earlier about uh, Steve Emmett and uh, the CCA events and how much signage he puts up all over the place. Um, and as you were saying, you know, he's very experienced at this and he's been doing it for a long time. So there's probably something in that. Um, I think also you might need a sign that says, please read the sign. Because um, <laughs> a lot of people don't actually read signs. Uh, they get a little lazy. So sometimes it's easier to ask the TD. Um, yeah, most people love asking the TD. They don't read the signs very well. The times I've worked at tournaments where there were a lot of special tournament rules, I get asked a lot, and I point to the posting, and they go, oh, I don't read that. Well, uh, a, a question you probably don't get asked too often, Tim, uh, I've been asked in the chat, is is there, uh, in your experience, is there a particular color paper that is best to use for signage? Um... I don't have anything to say one way is better than another. 
What a, some people who have things like uh, Swissis will print color signs for you, oddly enough. But if you can have Swissis at your tournament, you obviously have Word and you can print things in color. You need a color yeah. printer. Um, I find that uh, often in, in color, if you just take a magic marker and uh, underline something or you get one of those highlighters, which you can also use your printer for, just highlight something and people will catch that real quick. Yep. Sounds good. All right. And carrying on with this little topic, uh, I think I beat the uh, beat you to the punch with the second uh, little note here. Okay, wall charts. If you get those out early and often, people are happy. They want to see everybody who's at the tournament, even if they're not in their class, even if they're not competing with them for prizes. They'll notice that some grandmaster is there that they didn't realize was showing up, who happened to walk in the door and get a free entry because I like to give free entries to those grandmasters. They deserve it. They work hard. But on the wall charts, they can see who their competition is. They... Uh, they can check whatever it is that makes them happy. A lot of people like to do wall chart pairings. They like to see who their opponent's going to be in the future. So after a round is uh, started, you can just put up the wall charts. Round two starts and everybody's faced off against each other. Put that wall chart up with all the latest information. People like that. Yep. And then moving on. Yeah, here's something. You need by requests and withdrawals. If you post it, and you check it every round, you're not gonna mess up too often. It's been my experience that people love to walk up to you as a TD and say, I wanna buy on round three. Well, that's nice. And you'll tell them, yes, I can do that. And about 10 minutes later, you're gonna forget. You're gonna forget that well, who said that to you. You're for, gonna forget what round it was in. Put those sheets out so people can help you. And that helps yes. the whole tournament. You don't want somebody sitting there facing off against someone who had a buy or a withdrawal because they don't have an opponent. That's not right. Right. And, and and remember to post them too, right? If you if you post if them, you yes, post, post them. That's going to come up a little later. Yep. Uh, players cannot get enough information. You know, it doesn't matter what you put up; they love it. Yes. Uh, whatever you think as a TD, you would like to know as a player, post it. Put a sign up with that. Uh, you might even want to start laying flowers out right near the results sheets. That way you've been nice to other organizers and the players get to see what upcoming tournaments they might want to be involved in. Right. Good. Good stuff. All right. Uh, I think moving on. Second tip. I've learned this when I used to teach school. And I learned more teaching math than I ever did being a student of math through all the years I was in college. There's something about when you try to teach something to someone else, when you mentor someone else, you have to stop and think about what it is you want them to learn, what it is that the rule that you're trying to teach them or the technique you're trying to teach them really is involved with. What are the steps involved? And it's really nice for you and for the person you're mentoring and that you're teaching on how to be a TD. I've done this often. There's a there's a lot of people running around US chess right now that um, I taught to be a TD and they, I'm really proud of the fact that they've all done better than I have. They are all better TDs than I have. Wayne Clark is one of the, is one of the TDs that uh, I taught at the club level, brought him up through the ranks and then he just, he zoomed way past me, and he's done a great job doing that. No, we have a lot to blame you for then, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I usually find when I'm explaining something to someone, I, I sort of soak it in a little bit better. Um, you know, if I, if, I can, if I can teach someone how to do something, then it means I've probably uh, at least, you know, mastered that, or at least I know what I'm talking about. It, it does help you soak it in a little bit more. Yeah. So it's good. And we're all happy to, to help other TDs, um, to, you know, be, become better TDs, I guess. All right, moving on. Next tip. I think. We're back to these again. Um, a lot of TDs forget to even make these. Make them. Make it. Just bring them with you. Print them off first thing when you set up your printer and your computer 
or print them off at home and bring them with you if you've got a small event and you're working at a club. And then check them. Don't, it's got to be part of your routine to look at it and say, hey, I'm about to do the pairings. Well, let me check the buys and the withdrawal list. And you're going to make a lot fewer mistakes and the clientele is going to be a lot happier. And as I just mentioned, check them before you do your pairings. Yep. Um, I found over the years that new players really don't understand buy sheets and withdrawal sheets. Too often, a new player will think, oh, I lost my first game. I guess I'm done for the day, and they go home. They need to know that, well, first of all, you don't get to go home. If you signed up for five games, we're going to give you five games, if at all possible. And new players need a little hand-holding and showing them about buy sheets and withdrawal sheets is going to make their life easy and make the whole experience more pleasant for them. And they're more likely to come back. Good step. Oh, moving on. Yeah, here's something that you don't see too often uh, given out as, as a tip. After round one starts, matter of fact, after any round starts, <clears throat> walk through that tournament hall. I'm not... I'm not saying you should look and see if everybody's taking notation. I'm not saying you should check every clock, though both those are real good ideas. Check and see who's missing. Because sometimes you'll look around and say, ah, oh, board four. Let me look on my parents' sheet. Board four is Tom. Oops, Tom was supposed to get a buy this round. I shouldn't have paired him. But now you know you can take care of whatever you need to do with that opponent who's just sitting there with no one to play. You can maybe find someone else for that opponent to play in the extra game section. You can at the very least say, opponent, Tom's not coming. I think you can go have some lunch. You can do that right now. You don't have to wait an hour. All right. And we just, you just uh, give it that one? That's what I just mentioned. It looks like I... Uh, my brain works ahead of what shows up on here. It's okay. Um, so one of the one of the things, uh, especially in the National Scholastics, when we're checking for no shows, um, I've had issues where uh, there's been uh, a no show um, on two boards, uh, and they've been next to each other, and invariably those two people were meant to be playing each other. So when you're checking for no shows and and you're looking for um, empty spots, um, you can normally resolve weird issues like that. Like I've had the bottom of the section, um, I've had one person sat with no opponent, I've had the other person sat with no opponent, uh, except they've been sat on a board that isn't actually part of the tournament, so I knew that they were sat in the wrong place. So if you if you just check for no-shows, um, you, you can actually uh, resolve some little weird issues as well uh, that might come up um, here or there. It, it usually only a scholastic type thing, uh, wouldn't probably happen. In a, in a regular tournament, but um, yes. Um, so we got Mike Hoffpower in the chat as well, and he's, he's saying that new players often think their pairing number is actually their board number. So there's a lot, you know, with new players, um, especially the Scholastic kids, um, you know, you'll find sometimes kids sit in the wrong place, it happens. Um, but you can, if you, if you go and quickly check for no-shows a few minutes into the round, it should be part of someone's responsibility at least. Yeah. Um, then yeah. you can you can you can usually resolve a lot of issues. Uh, one quick question, Tim. Maybe uh, just going off on a tangent here, you can add an eleventh tip. Um, we had someone asking um, if you have any uh, tip to teach new players how to read tournament life announcements. Teach them how to do what? Read TLAs. Uh, I guess the TLA is very in uh, you, yeah, chess life. A, is a little. You could sit down with them when they're done with their game, and go through it line by line to teach it to them. Right. And then one of the other suggestions we got is if you have an actual flyer and the TLA, uh, you yeah. can compare compare the two and show them, you know, why the information is. TLAs are a little little strange. They uh they they're they're sometimes very hard to read and organizers are different from organizer to organizer how they like to put things. Um, various things. Yeah, there's but, a whole yeah. pile of things you should have handy in case someone wants it. If someone is upset with the way you've done something and they're not satisfied and they want to they want to get involved in the process of contacting USCM, you should have a sheet that tells them how to do that and just hand it to them. That way 
you stay out of it for the most part and say, look, I know you're unhappy with me. Here's something you can do if you really think that I've done something wrong and I've damaged you. And you give them the sheet and it tells them what steps they need to take. And then they can decide if it's really worth the effort to do that. All right, let's move on to your next tip. I learned this from Freddie Grunberg. I learned it when I started working at the National Open. If you start rounds on time, the players are going to think you are the greatest TV that ever lived. They just don't want to sit around and wait for 45 minutes because you've decided, well, I see 10 more players in line here. I'm going to get them registered first. They said to themselves, I did everything right. Why do I have to wait for my round to start? You start on time, everybody's happy. There are all kinds of techniques to deal with players that show up after the 7 a.m., 7 a.m., 7 p.m. round starts. You can pair them against each other. You can give them buys. You can pair them uh, with other people who are standing around and just being spectators. And you can pair them with anybody who's willing to play in the game. Um, but if you start on time, what's going to happen very quickly is you'll get the reputation of starting on time and you'll find very few late players. Yes, no, I, I, I definitely, when I'm working the National Open, um, it, it's, I like to try and start every uh, round on time, of course. Uh, the National Open is definitely one of those where it, it is a um, sort of a must and, and the tournament is proud to say that it likes to start rounds on time and we always try to fit that in. Um, of course, when I work any event, uh, it, it, it's always nice to start on time. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some, some things always hold us up, but let's not make excuses, you know, get those rounds started on time. Very important. What yeah, so Mike Hoffpower is saying it helps to get the parents out the room. Well, <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge in itself, I think. Yes, but. it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the tales from the National Open, the starting rounds on time, um, well, very often the National Open is run during March Madness. And on board one, in one of the sections, we TDs were looking around and neither player was there. We started on time. Now, I understand one player not showing up, especially in Vegas. I don't They might be on a winning streak. Uh, it may not be feeling very chipper at the moment. We found both these players sitting at the bar watching March Madness. Each of them were rooting for a different team and <laughs> hadn't realized the round had started. And once we told them, they said, well, when this game is over, we'll come in and play the round. We made them come in at that point and play the round. Great. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Here's a rule of thumb. I know you did a show on prize winners and splitting up prizes, and often you have to lump prizes together. And the rule of thumb is pretty easy. You can't have more prizes in the pot than you have players. So if you have two players and you have five prizes in the pot, there's an error somewhere. You can only put the two highest prizes that these players qualify for in that pot to split up. Now that prize might be first place overall, and first place in the B class because the B class prize is higher than second place. Okay, that's what you do. Two players, two prizes. Now the easy ones are one player, one prize. Someone went 5-0 and nobody tied with them. That's pretty simple. Yeah. But 10 players can't split up 11 prizes. Something's wrong. You're gonna have to take a prize out. Usually look for, the way I've done it in the past is I just list the prizes from greatest to least, and I look at which prizes the players in the tie qualify for, and the biggest numbers get thrown right into that pot. And you grab your little nifty dipty calculator or spreadsheet and pay out those monies. I know it's a subject we've been asked for quite a bit, so I'm sure I'm sure we'll cover more about prize uh, prizes and how to divvy those prizes up at some stage uh, in the coming weeks. So, um, and as uh, Mike Hoffpower is uh, pointing out in the chat again, uh, of course there is an exception if you've got special prizes. So like top, top female player, you know, best game prize, something along those lines, but those well, don't really come into the, into the prize pool for this calculation. That's, that's an interesting point. Female prizes, uh, person who drove the furthest, oldest male player, 
youngest female player. Those are special prizes. They don't get thrown in the pot. They're separate. They get awarded separately, and they have nothing to do with splitting up prize money. Now, you might find two 89-year-olds who played in the tournament, and they would split that special prize, but those special prizes are totally separate from any of the place prizes, any of the class prizes, any of the under prizes. Exactly. All right, let's keep going. Okay, physically challenged players. When I was young and inexperienced, I see somebody come in in a wheelchair and I say, oh, I know what board I'm gonna put them on. I know where they belong in the tournament room. That's actually a bad attitude. Ask them what they want. They're a player like anybody else and they might have not have any needs at all. They might say, just pair me. I'll make sure I sit at that board, wherever it is. Or they might say, I always need an end board at the back of the tournament hall. They'll tell you what they need give it to them it's really simple yeah and don't make assumptions you know so it's uh as as much as you're trying to do the right thing um yeah yeah i mean yeah the right thing is to say what are you needs how can i meet them that's the right thing exactly and uh let's move on to tip number eight get a parents program i know there are people out there that will say oh i only got 20 players i can do this using parenting cards, yes, you can. And then when you go to hand the event in to US Chess, you're gonna have to sit there and enter all the stuff on your computer anyway <laughs> when you <laughs> turn it in. You might as well just get a pairings program and enter that material and you'll have up-to-date wall charts. You'll have a whole bevy of information that people are gonna love you for. A um, lot less paperwork and it makes you a lot more efficient um it's it's a permanent assistant tv it doesn't get tired and here's here's something i noticed over the years we used to do pairings even for the national open on cards it it was boy it was energy draining soon as we got a tv pairings program first of all we were a little happier because we didn't have to sit there and by hand fill out cards and less mistakes were made and the players stopped griping about the pairings as often. They just knew that that program was not making any human errors. Now, whether it did or not is immaterial, that's what they believed. And yeah, get yourself a cheap laptop and printer. It works fine for chess events. Um, until recently, I used one for years and years and years. Pretty the operating system was no longer supported, so I quit using it. I just decided it really wasn't worth someone breaking into because there is information on my laptop. I would sit at the site and I would uh, turn in the event before I left the site. That way when players got home, most of them would go check and say, wow, look at my new rating. And that's pretty important to players. Yep, and we're getting some really important uh, tips in the, in the chat as well. Um, of course, it's, it's very important for you to learn actually how to actually use the pairing program. There's a lot of settings and various things that you can, if you tinker too much or play with them too much, you, you're going to get the wrong pairings and it becomes um, not as useful at that stage. So, so definitely um, make sure you, uh, you learn how to use the pairings program. Uh, maybe that's another uh, future yeah. episode we'll do. Yeah. And then also make backups. Um, oh, the last yeah. thing you want is for... Um, the program to crash, suddenly the file is all corrupt and you don't have a backup. So now you're recreating four or five rounds of, um, you know, from looking at the, the results and, you know, the wall charts and various things that you've kept and, and you're trying to recreate uh, everything so that it meets with the previous rounds. So, um, yeah. Back up, back up, back up, back up. A thumb drive is a good place to do that if you don't have internet access at some site. Um just do it. Dump your yeah. files there. You've got an extra copy. And if you're uh, like the great TD, Walter Brown, back up your backup. Exactly. All right. Yes, we're getting we're getting various things about Swissys and WinTD, uh, the, the two main um, programs that are used here in the U.S. Uh, in the chat. So read the chat for more tips. Um, so uh, carrying on here to the ninth uh, tip. This is one that really is related to, you're gonna see my head move a little bit over here. 
Uh, it's one of the seven highly effective habits. It's uh, first seek to understand. People have a need to tell their side of the story, even when you're sitting there listening to them thinking, but they're dead wrong. That's not the rule. They need to tell you what they believe the rule is, what they say happened, what they believe should be the result. If you cut them off and just make a ruling, they feel slighted. They feel like you haven't been fair with them. So listen to them. And in your arsenal, the things to tell people is, I understand your point of view. Unfortunately, the rules right now say this, and this is what we're going to have to go with. Uh, if you want later on, you and I can talk about how we can change that rule. But thank you for telling me your point of view. Yeah, that's what I just said. They, people just need to be heard. It's really that simple. Thanks, Tom. And they're going to love you for it. They're going to think you are, uh, if you start the rounds on time and you listen to their point of view, wow, thumbs up to you. I know that uh, I mentioned Todd Berry earlier at one event. Some guy came in with a new way to pair players, and he was convinced this was the fairest, most exciting way to pair a tournament. Todd sat there and listened to him and nodded his head, and the guy walked away perfectly happy, even though there wasn't a chance in heck that that program was ever going to be used and that pairing method was ever going to be passed by the delegates. And a couple of other good things pointed out in the chat. Tom Langland um, says, uh, you know, you should probably listen more than you actually talk. Um, and then uh, I believe that's Boyd Reed that's uh, tuning in. Uh, hi, boss. Um, <laughs> says set ground rules for those discussions up front. Um, and, and don't interrupt them once once you've set those ground rules. If, if that's part of the rules, you're letting them tell their side of the story. Let let them go ahead and uh, and do that and get the whole um, thing before you uh, sort of interrupt them. Yeah, I've uh, I've, I've seen that used real effectively uh, at various tournaments where I was part of the staff and the chief TV and had to settle some dispute. And he'd say, "Player A, tell me your side of the story," and he'd listen. And he'd say, "Player B," and Player A would try to interrupt and he'd say, "I I heard your side of the story. I need to hear the other side right now, please." Right. Um, and remember, there are there are always two sides to every every story. So there are it's usually Jesus. white and black, and some possibly more sides to the story, uh, depending on what else is going on. Let's see if I can get this right. There's a there's a saying I ran across uh, by Robert Evans, the movie producer. He said, "There's a, I think he said there's three sides to the truth: your side, my side, and the truth." <laughs> and somehow I, I think he nailed it. That's usually what happens. We all seem to color what happened through our own lenses in our brain. Yep. All right, I'm moving on to uh, the last tip of uh, tonight's uh, episode before we get on to the uh, trivia that I know everyone's been waiting for. Uh, oh, and yes, it used less time dealing with uh, discontented players in the future if you, uh, yeah. you know, if, if, if you deal with them in the, correctly in the, in the first place. Um, go ahead, Tim. Someone's not gonna like what you do. It's going to happen, even though you know you're right. They're convinced they're right, and and they are going to try to review a new one, as the saying goes. They're going to try to denigrate you, denigrate your ability. You know what? If you did the best you can do, that's all that can be expected. There's always going to be something or someone that they don't like what you've done. Okay, it's a you know the kind of country we're allowed to have different opinions. But you're in charge. You have to run things the way you know is the right way. And if they disagree, like I said, hey, give them that little sheet and say, here, you can you can go to the TDCC and complain about the way I'm doing it. But I'm sorry you feel bad about this. I'm sorry we disagree. But can we move on to the next round? Can we move on to the next game? Can we move on? Yep. Yeah. Oh, a couple of things there. But... Yeah. Um, speaks for itself. You're not going to please everyone all the time. And it doesn't mean you're a bad TV. It just means they think you're a bad TV. They're allowed to think that. It doesn't make it true. It makes it their opinion. Yep. And really, if you make a mistake, fix it. That's part of your job of running a tournament right. Fix your mistakes and then go on. 
<clears throat> and I think I remember um, I was speaking to a local TD who had made a mistake um, during one of their rulings, and and they were really sort of eat up, you know, eaten up inside about it. And you know, you um, as as a chief TD, you know, you you bring them through it, but it making a mistake happens. Um, yeah. we all make mistakes. Um, the uh, the exams that you take um, to get to high level of, of a TD you, is eighty percent is the pass mark. So one in every five ruling you can get wrong. Um, it doesn't mean we want you to get them wrong, but everybody makes mistakes. And um, someone once told me that um, all it means if you're an NTD versus a um, you know someone who's not an NTD is that we've just made probably made more mistakes than than the other level TDs because we learn from those mistakes. So usually if you if you make a mistake that's something that you take with you for the rest of your life and you never want to make that mistake again. And normally if you've had a bad episode with it, you don't make that mistake again. So, um, you know, put it right. Um, yeah, yeah. just as, as we're being told in the chat, just about every mistake is fixable. Um, so what I've said in the past is NTDs probably are no better than club TDs, except for one thing. They have experience and they have a whole toolbox of ways to fix their mistakes. Because exactly. they're going to make them, but they, they've got all sorts of little tricks they can use to make it right. And uh, it takes a long time to put a lot of tools in that toolbox, or yep. maybe not. Some people are just naturally good at fixing things. Right. No, it, it definitely, uh, it does help if you, if you made some mistakes, you, you know how to sugarcoat them and cover them up a little bit. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is uh, Tim's top 10 uh, TD tips, as, as I've called it. Uh, there are many, many more um, TD tips, and uh, thank you, Tim, for sharing those with us. Tim has been uh, kind enough to help with this week's trivia. Um, so I'm um, guessing that nobody is going to score five out of five tonight. Um, so, you know, um, I, I don't think I'd put money on that. But uh, let's let's see if that's true. So let's move on to the trivia, and uh, see how everyone does here. So let me uh, do a couple of quick things over here, and ta -da! technical issues. All right, we are good. So let's move on to the trivia, and you'll see tonight uh, the answers are not A, B, C, D. Uh, they are one, two, three, four, and uh, let me go ahead and. Announce that you can uh, vote one, two, three, four. So anyway, so Tim came up with these questions. Who was the first parent and then their child to both become NTDs? Uh, is it one, Alan and Tom Priest? Two, uh, we got Tom in the in the chat. Uh, Tom and Jordan Langland. Three, Myron and Will Thomas. Or is it four, Mike and Betsy Zaket? So go ahead and type one, two, three, or four in the chat. And we'll see how we're doing. So we have 33% uh, of people have gone for one and 66% of people have gone for four and nobody's gone for the middle two yet. Uh, and I noticed Tom did not vote for himself. That's that's probably a good sign. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Brian Yang is saying, this isn't fair. This was before he was born. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and close that off. We had eight votes. 25% of people um, said... Uh, one and 75% of people said four and the correct answer is number four number four Mike and Betsy Zeke so um, I know Betsy is still very much an active uh, Mike is retired uh, Mike, yeah. Mike recently retired and said that's it I've got to pull the plug uh, my age and everything else in life it's time for the young people to take over right. so let's uh Go ahead and set up question number two here. So I, I guess uh, six people um, got that one right. So let's uh, go ahead and announce this one open for vote. So who was the editor of the third edition of the US Chess Rulebook? Was it one, Tim Just, two, Tim Redman, three, Carol Jarecki, or four, Bill Goichberg? Ooh, we seem to have a consensus so far in the chat. There's a lot of votes for two, which would be Tim Redman. And we got nine votes on this one. A lot more confidence on this one, I think. Yeah. Um, 
when Tim so let's, did the uh, move, I got to uh, I got to visit with him, and uh, and then when uh, the contract came up for me to start on the um, fifth edition, he was sort of my mentor. He said, "Look, here's here's how negotiations will go, and here's what's expected of you." And uh, it was great to have him around as a mentor to kind of lead right. me down that road because there were a lot of things I didn't know about being editor at that time. Right, and just to confirm, the answer is number two, Tim Redman. That's right. So, uh, yeah. interesting minor question. Um, Bill Gorsberg has his name on the uh, fourth edition, but Karen Jarecki also was an editor on that particular edition. All right, let me uh, <laughs> a question. Does this mean the next ed editor has to be named Tim? Well, I'm not sure if every editor has been named Tim, but well, I guess we'll see. All right, let's move on to question three. Um, which edition of the US Chess Rules was the first to be freely available on the US Chess website? Was it one, the seventh edition, two, the sixth edition, three, the fifth edition, or four, wait, what? The US Chess Rules are available online for free? Let's play the Jeopardy music here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we need. So, some, yeah. some music. <laughs> And some people, uh, yes. Well, I don't know if number four can be an incorrect answer. I guess <laughs> you're asking a question with a, answer a question with a question. Um, so we've got various um, various answers here. So it's uh, ah, someone's questioning rule changes. No, 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 no. We're not talking about the rules changes. We're talking about a full edition of the U.S. Chess Rules, meaning chapters one and two. <laughs> people are changing their votes now. All right, we're still taking a couple of votes. So let's go ahead and uh, close that off and announce the voting results. So we had 55% of people say one, 22% of people say two, 11% say three, and we also had 11% say four. And uh, what? the correct, yeah. <laughs> well, that somebody's learned something new tonight. Yes, the US Chess rules are available on the US Chess website for free. And that started with the- Seventh edition. Seventh edition, the latest edition. I yes. guess, uh, I've, I've had NTDs do no, you know vote for number four. They they say what what do you mean the rules are available online? Uh, for those of you who aren't sure where they are, if you go to the U.S. Chess site main page, scroll down to that big black area at the bottom, and uh, look in the middle column. I think it's at the top of the middle column. If not, it's very close to the top. You point and click, and a beautiful picture of yours truly pops up and then you can point and click what you want you can get just chapter one just chapter two just chapter 11 or all three packaged together in a download they're all pdf format uh some new material was just put up the other day but it was minor stuff it wasn't a rules change but there were uh, some corrections the editor had to make me because there were some uh there was some new information about clocks and I had to correct a few other little minor things like there were periods missing and something was italicized that shouldn't be. The kind of stuff that nobody notices except editors. Right. All right, let's move on to question number four. And I think we're gonna get back towards TD uh, realm here. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and open this one up for the voting uh, while I read it. So when can a TD substitute an analog clock for a digital clock? Um, is it one, when no other digital clock is available? Two, never, you can't do that. Three, is it if white started the game with a digital clock and black arrived late, but wants to use his analog clock before determining a move, black's choice? Or is it C, uh, is it four, the same as in, oh, three, yes, I didn't change that, um, Hi, except <laughs> only if the time control does not have an increment or delay. Uh, yes, yeah, some people are saying this is an easy one. <laughs> and let's uh, well, see. Good. We'll see if they uh, the easy ones. We, we seem to have a consensus on the uh, answer by everybody. <laughs> yes, my cough power is saying Fide, never. Um, <laughs> never? And I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a, 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 um, a serious vote or not. But anyway, let's, let's close off the poll and we'll announce those. Uh, uh, so, yes, I, yeah. Well, the the questions used to be A, B, C, D, and I guess I forgot to change that. So, um, ninety percent of people said one, and one person said four. 
So, uh, uh, what what would be the right answer there, Tim? Well, interesting the way you did it. It's when there's no other digital plaque available. Exactly. So the correct answer. But is number right. four. Let's give that equal credit, you know. Uh, well, I think the new rule says that a digital clock is always preferred over an analog clock. Oh, so. yeah, always. <laughs> always. If you read the, the rule book the way it was changed a couple of years ago, yep. <clears throat> essentially, I don't know why we even mention analog clocks, except that the delegates think it's important. And I guess some people still use them. They still or use them? At least they try to. So. All right, and moving on to question five, the last question of the night, as usual. Uh, so let's see. Um, why would a player call their own flagfall? Um, one, there is never a good reason to call your own flagfall. Two, to prevent their opponent from filling in the moves on their score sheet, to claim a win on time in non-sudden death. Uh, three, to prevent their opponent from filling in the moves on their score sheet, to claim a win on time in sudden death time controls or four to save time and get the next round paired <laughs> <laughs> we'd all like to think it was four i think <laughs> you know are you volunteering to write the new tv exams <laughs> <laughs> you could do that one of my what well, people are looking at that one of my favorite and i don't even know if it's there anymore one of my favorite answers on a tv exam is TD bangs his head against the wall. Can't believe a player actually said that. <laughs> All right, so let's clear. We got 10 votes on that one, and we had a consensus on two being the answer. Is that correct? <laughs> yep, that's it. That's perfect. And it only works in non sudden death time controls. In increment time controls, you have to be taking notation anyway. And in sudden death, it makes no difference. You don't want to call that your own flag is down. In non-sudden death, if you call the flag, your opponent has to stop taking down notation. Oh, they can keep going, but you have to point out to the TD. And if you walk up and you're the TD, someone says, but I'm, uh, this guy's missing 10 moves, my opponent. He can't fill them in anymore. I call the flag there on move 20, and the time controls at move 30. <laughs> All right, folks. Be honest. Did anyone get? Did anyone get five out of five? Uh, let's let's see. Uh, uh, David Hader is uh, saying he got five out of five. Out of five. Um, possibly he did. He's a politician. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention that. Um, so anyway, that concludes tonight's show. Uh, all of Tim's tips and uh, the the trivia. And if you want to get more information from uh, National Tournament Director and Rulebook Editor Tim Just, um, you can, well, you know, obviously get the 7th edition of the U.S. Chess Federation Official Rules of Chess. But Tim has also authored a couple of other books, uh, Just Law, which I believe provides uh, more TD tips and advice uh, on, on how to read the rules and do that stuff. Is that correct? That's correct. It's, a, it's in a general question and answer type format uh, so that... I don't know, I felt like doing it that way, basically. Um, actually, the, the impetus for that book is from the um, from another fellow that was going to publish it for me, and uh, he died. So I had to publish it myself. And then uh, My Opponent is Eating a Donut. I believe you wrote that in uh, collaboration with Wayne Clark. Uh, that Certainly covers did. a lot of your fun stories that That's you've right. had with Wayne and yeah, yourself over, over the last few years. Book, by the way, the current book that that's being hawked is uh, humor and chess, and it's mostly scholastic stories. My opponent is eating a donut, comes directly, the title comes directly from an incident that happened at the National Open. And you're right, it's just filled with humorous stories, and you gotta shake your head and go, really, that really happened? Yes, it did. Wayne and I were sitting around one day, uh, we, we, we drank coffee at the local coffee shop, and somebody who doesn't know anything about chess was asking us about stuff. And my little brain said, you know, Wayne, we need to sit down every week and tell this guy these stories, and I'll write down a little note, and then you and I can come up with this book. And that's what we did. That was a silly thing to do, but we got to have a lot of coffee, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I love the book. Actually, my, my favorite bit is uh, being at an event with Wayne and actually hearing these stories live being told by Wayne. I, I think he needs, like, a podcast to tell these yeah. stories. You don't quite get the fun 
um, from you know as much fun from reading the stories in the book. But I mean, it's great to hear Wayne uh, tell that, a lot of these cool. tell um, a lot of these stories. He adds a lot of character to it. That's for sure. Okay. When I when, <laughs> I when I tell the main story from my opponents eating a donut uh, to non chess players, yeah, uh, they get it because it's a, <laughs> it's a good story that this poor guy just hated anybody eating at his board and he complains and complains and and turns out donuts are being served the next round by Freddie Grunberg at the National Open. The guy just, he was beyond himself. I sent him to Freddie. I, I didn't want to deal with him. Right. And then uh, there was also some uh, yeah, names are changed to protect the guilty. That's true. Yeah, I think they're all blanked out in the book. So, um, but if you speak to Wayne or Tim, I'm sure they'll tell you the real names. Um, so, and Tim has also done some videos. So actually, if you go to YouTube and you can search for Tim Just, uh, you'll see Tim's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can also search for Swissis and WinTD. Um, and you can find various tutorial videos that Tim has done on there. Very useful for if you're new to Swissis, WinTD, or even experienced and you just need to know how to do something. Uh, I think Swissis also has its own videos as well that yes, it's done, but uh, definitely for content from Tim, uh, check out YouTube. And then also, uh, Tim has a monthly column on US Chess. Um, it, 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 does the column have a name? Just the Rules? It's I called, think. yep, Just the Rules. Just the Rules. So uh, check out the monthly column on uh, US Chess. You can go to US Chess and just search for Tim Just, and uh, all Tim's articles will appear. Um, Tim, thank you very much for uh, offering to appear on uh, this episode of the TV show. Uh, I'm sure uh, from the looks of the chat, everyone is saying thank you. And uh, hopefully everyone uh, learned something today to take uh, um, uh, into the TD world once we get back going again. Um, we'll be able to put some of the practical advice that you've given to some use. And uh, I really it, it's, appreciate you asking me. Uh, it's been a privilege. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be back next week for another uh, episode of the TD show. So we'll see you all at nine o'clock Eastern uh, next Thursday. Have a good night, everyone.